I don't actually remember how I discovered you guys, but somehow or another, I ended up looking at your website and I thought, oh my gosh, this is super cool. I didn't know we had a worker co-op doing special effects for Star Wars and Guardians of the Galaxy and stuff like that. So um, yeah, I was super excited to, to find you guys. Hadn't ever um, heard of you. So maybe you could just uh, introduce yourselves and uh, tell us a little bit about how, uh, your co-op, how long you've been around, um, yeah. how many members you got, stuff like that. Um, well, I'll start with about just introducing myself. Um, so I'm Anthony Kramer, and uh, I've been in the visual effects business um, since about 2005. And um, I'm uh, traditionally, I've, I'm what you call a compositor. That's kind of what I've been doing in the visual effects business. Um, and uh, I would say about somewhere around 2009, 2010, I came across uh, worker co-ops, uh, you know, the idea of them anyway. Um, and so since about then, I've been wanting to uh, start or just be a part of a co-op um, and specifically in the visual effects business. And uh, so that's kind of what started my journey on this. And then um, I'll let John tell a little bit more, but, you know, we've only, we've only been a co-op as Nexodus since July of last year. Um, but I've been trying to get this going for, for quite a while. So John, go ahead. Yeah, um, my name's John Barron, the CEO of the company currently. Um, I've been in the entertainment business um, in doing either television or film since about 2005 as well. Um, and my main focus has been in uh, computer, like digital visual effects since probably about 2010. I would say, um, you know, prior to that I had worked kind of more in physical, physical production and development. Um, but really kind of started a, a focus on visual effects and my kind of education and my early visual effects days was around 2010. Um, I worked for a company, my, the first visual effects vendor I worked for was a company called Digital Domain. Um, that's currently in Venice, uh, California. They, they're, they're, you know, the thing that started them was basically Titanic. Uh, so that was like James Cameron's company in the, in the mid nineties that really did Titanic. And since then, uh, them alongside industrial light magic, the company that did star Wars kind of invented basically the industry as we know it today, along with a lot of software packages and techniques that are kind of still utilized, uh, in some way, shape or form today. I mean, a lot of the business has changed since then, um, where it's really fully digital now, whereas in the past, it used to be kind of a, a mixture of, uh, digital and like models and all kinds of te techniques to really execute kind of this, these imaginary places that don't exist, but only exist on film. Uh, a lot of which are basically optical illusions. Um, and uh, so from 2010 till, till now, I've been in and around doing production. I'm not actually an artist myself. I've kind of certainly stayed more on the business side and the producing side. Uh, Anthony's background is more of a, an artist, uh, artist background, certainly. Um, the company that, you know, one of the things I learned about, you know, being on the business side was that there, um, no matter how a lot of these big companies want to want to swing it, there, there really is not any proprietary technology today that allows people to execute like feature film quality visual effects work. The ability to do that is really in the knowledge and the collective knowledge of any group of talent that you, you may have. So, you know, with that in mind, it, you know, really, I think lends itself well to a cooperative model because everything that you see in film and television that's visual effects is really built on the labor of the artists. Um, and if you boil it down to the sheer mathematics of how these big companies determine how much something it's going to cost, it really boils down to, well, how many days is it going to take somebody to do something? So, you know, with that model, you can kind of see how it kind of directly equates to like a traditional setup of a cooperative that's based on labor contribution. And, you know, this is just a way of organizing a group of, you know, 
talented artists that have a lot of experience in film and television that have a high degree of technical proficiency, you know, with the goal of creating an environment that generates profit for themselves and not necessarily for any particular shareholder. And, and the ends of it really is not that, you know, we're not all trying to drive drive away in Ferraris on this. We're all really just trying to make a you know, good living and support families and things. And I think the distribution of the profit across membership maybe will help help with that. Also, historically, the, the entertainment business, film and television especially, uh, kind of was born in a time where um, there were unions and guilds. Like a lot of other disciplines within entertainment are fall under the, you know, the, the auspice of uh, uh, IOTSI, which is the uh, stage and theatrical um, workers union. And, you know, that, that union then has a bunch of sub guilds, basically, like your Directors Guild of America, you know, there's the Cinematographers Guild, there's the Screen Actors Guild. And there's all these, you know, all these specialties have these kind of union protections and, you know, union bargaining, collective bargaining agreements, which, you know, visual effects was born in the 90s, which was kind of after unionization, you know, kind of already had its like, you know, golden days, let's say. And it was kind of just always kind of brushed aside. There have been attempts to unionize uh, some, some shops and none of them have really ever been successful. So, you know, visual effects in general has kind of just always been on the sidelines. Well, things are certainly project-based and, you know, big studios have agreements with IATSE to hire only union workers. There's no such thing for visual effects artists. So, you know, unfortunately, um, they, they don't have a lot of the same visual effects artists traditionally don't have a lot of the same, you know, worker, you know, protections and the collective bargaining power that, that, uh, a lot of these unions do. So this maybe is an attempt, you know, utilizing a cooperative model and it is maybe a modern attempt that, you know, in a more capitalist world to try to, to develop some of that collective bargaining power, I guess. Yeah. As far as you know, are, is Nexodus the only cooperatively organized visual effects studio in the, in the U.S. anyway? As far as, as, far as we know, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and you said you, uh, Anthony, you said you'd, um, had, you just kind of officially became the co-op about nine months ago now. Um, mm -hmm. And did... Nexodus exist before that? Uh, did it convert it, to a co-op or, or is this a brand new thing? Yeah, so when I, I lived in LA for, for many years. Um, when I started in, in the business, I was out there and, uh, you know, around, around 2009, 2010, somewhere in there, I started to, you know, want to have a family and, you know, do those types of things. And so I was looking for some job security and, uh, you know, I was working at the time, I was working at Sony, which is a big company. Um, and I had been there for, you know, I was pretty dug in there. I was there for a couple of years, which in the visual effects business is a long time. Um, and uh, there was an attempt to unionize uh, the studio um, at that time and it, and it failed. And that, um, that hit me pretty hard because I really like, I felt like that was going to be the thing that was going to give me a little bit of, you know, job security. Because even though I had been at Sony, I was technically a, a a um, employee, a staff employee, um, I never really felt secure in my job just because the industry is so volatile. And they were moving a lot of work to Vancouver at the time. And so it was like, well, you know, if I buy a house here in LA, you know, am I going to have to, you know, travel to Vancouver to pay for that house in LA? You know, it was like, it was becoming that kind of a thing. So around that time, my wife and I decided, you know, that we were just gonna, I was gonna try and do my own thing. And that's kind of um, when it started. And I had already kind of been doing some visual effects work on the side, like at, like moonlighting and stuff like that. So I had some clients of my own. Um, and so I decided, you know, if I really spend time on this, I could probably do this full time and we could move somewhere where the cost of living is way cheaper. And, you know, uh, and so we did that, we decided to just, do that. So uh, it took a couple of years to make the transition, but I moved out to, I live in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, and 
we moved out here, bought a house, and I started a small company called Mass Exodus. And my intention for that business was to convert it to a co-op when I had enough people working with me that we could do that. And, uh, you know, for the most part, it was just me. But then, like, I started bringing some friends in. If I got a lot of work, I would bring in, like, my friend Frank, who's a member of the co-op now. Um, I'd bring him in. He would do some work with me. And I would kind of, even though we weren't officially a co-op, I would share the profits as if we were a co-op. So... Um, you know, on projects where Frank did a lot more work, he would end up getting, you know, uh, like a, a good, a better cut of the profits at the, at the end of it. And so um, Frank was like, oh man, this is great. You know, let, you know, let's make this, let's do this all the time. And so, uh, but we were always missing, um, it, it, it seemed to be just timing, never kind of worked out, but we were always missing like uh, you know, John, for instance, like we needed that person like John, who could be the business side of the business and bring work in while the artists are working on stuff. Because uh, I found that, you know, after a while, like, I just couldn't, uh, I couldn't do it on my own anymore, because I was doing the work, I was getting the work, I was doing the marketing, I was basically the whole company, you know. And so um, Mass Exodus never ceased to exist, but I started basically working directly for another company um, as a visual effects supervisor remotely. And I did that for um, like three years or so. Um, and then I, I guess it was maybe, what was it, John, like two years ago or something like that when- yeah, 2018. You kind of came in the picture. Yep. Um, you want to kind of take it from there? No, it was, you know, it was good timing. You know, I had, uh, like Anthony said, I had uh, kind of chased a lot of this work around the globe, <laughs> so to speak. He had mentioned a lot of it up and went to, to, to Canada and that, you know, that is a whole other story that we could have a whole other conversation on. So I won't even go there. Just know that around the mid 2000s or I guess 2007 to 2012, really a lot of, a lot of work left California and went to Canada for uh, provincial and federal tax incentives up there. Uh, that combined with the uh, currency exchange advantage really made it cost effective to do do work there as opposed to in the U.S. Um, and I, I moved to Vancouver. So I moved from Los Angeles where I had worked for 11 years and moved to Vancouver to kind of do that thing. And then, you know, at the same time, my wife and I had two children. And I think, you know, you have kids and maybe like what you're doing in your life, you kind of reevaluate and things change and you develop different priorities. And I think we decided we wanted to move back to the, to the U.S. to be closer to family. So I'm in Ohio now. And... Um, you know, Anthony approached me to do this and I was still trying to figure out kind of what was what was next for me because um, I had all these years of experience in this industry. What am I going to try? Let's try to do something. And Anthony approached me with this idea of doing a fully virtual visual effects studio uh, developed as a cooperative that would allow people to work kind of remotely from anywhere on the planet. And, you know, that this was in 2018, this was way before coronavirus or anything. So that wasn't even on our radar when we started this. And, you know, when I had moved to Vancouver, I did so for another company called uh, Pixmundo. I was uh, helping expand their operations to Vancouver. They didn't have an office there. They, it's a privately owned company that's headquarters in, uh, in LA. It started as a German company, but they had seven, seven offices globally. And I opened the, helped them open the Vancouver office. And in that process, you know, I did a lot of financial math on uh, what, because they were going to have to make investments in hardware and stuff and technology. And I did a lot of financial math on what, what the best direction was to take. And a lot of my financial math pointed towards virtualization, utilizing uh, uh, like a compute solution like Amazon or Google, as opposed to having physical machines in a building, so to speak. Um, and that for the really the first time in about 2016 was viable. You know, prior to that, there were bandwidth limitations and, you know, just compute limitations that really didn't make it, uh, didn't make it a viable solution. But in 2016, it started to become one. In 2018, when we had this thought, it was definitely at the forefront and both from an, an effectiveness standpoint and a cost efficiency standpoint was kind of, you know, the right way to go, so to speak. And I think it will continue to even get better. And I think um, 
you know, the, the writing's kind of on the wall for the old, the old method. And I think this is probably, you know, we're one of probably the first people to, to maneuver towards complete virtualization in this business. Now, coronavirus happens and a lot of things get accelerated and acceptance of people working from home in a business that's traditionally pretty protective of its data has opened up quite a bit. And other people are certainly making strides to do you know, what we've done. We may have just have a little bit of a head start on them. And we're certainly not a big company. We're not the size of Industrial Light and Magic or Digital Domain. Um, that's okay. We'll get there someday, maybe. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think kind of just getting, getting, getting back to the point of it, I think in 2018, it was the first time that that was really the way you could design a business. And that's kind of the route, the route that we decided to take. And, you know, getting back to something I said a little bit earlier, you know, there's no single technology that really allows any one company to do what we do better than another company. A lot of it is in, is in, the, is in the brain power of the employees. And also along, along with that, you know, back, you know, five, 10, back 10 years ago, let's say in this business, the ability to do this or even to start on day one took an enormous initial investment, like millions of dollars in computers and in render farms, the size of warehouses. Like it, it just took a lot of financial assets and resources to just start. So there was a huge gateway to entry for smaller companies, especially, you know, like worker owned companies without maybe a bunch of startup capital. And what these like services like Amazon and Google have allowed you to do is kind of uh, switch to like a pay as you go model so that you don't really need to have the initial capital upfront because all of these computers that you're, you're using, you're, you're just renting basically, or you're buying by, you're paying for them by the minute. So you don't have to have $5 million up front in a big building to start. And it eliminates, you know, kind of the gateway to entry for a lot of these smaller companies like ours and, and, and let's say worker owned companies where you don't have an initial investor that just gives you $5 million and expects a, a return on investment. Mm -hmm. So I think both from a technological standpoint and, you know, it, it's, it's kind of just, it was very conducive to this happening in 2018, I think. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, yeah. It's going to go that way. Very good decision you guys made two yeah. years <laughs> before but, it became mandatory for everybody. Yeah, well, if we could do without a coronavirus, I would. Uh, I would. I <laughs> sure, would be, that would be better. Out, but but yeah. right place, right time for you guys. Yeah. So. But, to, but to answer your question, so you know, the company kind of originally started as as Mass Exodus, which was just mm -hmm. uh, an LLC that I that I owned, and then when John and I came together with Frank in 2018, was it? Yeah, yeah, we're around there. 2018. Yeah, July 2018, we started uh, 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 another LLC called Nimble Heroes LLC, and that was a partnership. Um, and that was like our intention at that point was for that LLC to just be organized as a cooperative. It never really, it was a partnership because all of us were equal owners in the in the LLC. Mm -hmm. um, but then. Uh, last year around July, we converted that LLC into the corporation and, and the, the cooperative corporate. And that's when we like adopted our bylaws and mm, all that mm -hmm. stuff. So that's kind of when that transition happened. I think the only reason we didn't do it originally in 2018 was just uh, legal knowledge of how to actually execute it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know how to do it. It's not something that's on legal zoom. Um, and it, you have to have a, a couple thousand dollars to pay an attorney to help you figure it all out, which I don't think we, we were ready to spend yet until we proved out that the business would work. And I think we use kind of nimble heroes as like a test bed for if the technology would work. And then mm -hmm. once it kind of was proven that it worked and we were able to develop some consistent revenue, we we're like, okay, now let's, let's reorganize this the way that we intended. And that's, that was kind of the way, the reason it started kind of organically like that nice. for us. And so... And so you take mass exodus and nimble heroes and you put them together and you get an exodus, right? Am I? I, I mean, <laughs> kind of, yeah. yeah, more or less. More or I'm less. a word guy. So of course I'm like, oh, okay. Is I it, think is mass, exodus next... proved, mass exodus proved that there were clients that were willing to pay for people that worked remote, yeah. you know? And nimble heroes proved that this new virtualization technology worked. So you kind of bring both of those things together and then 
some elements of people from the outside that weren't previously in the company mm -hmm. and you kind of have something that works. And then we called that an exodus. Nice. So how many um, people do, uh, are actually members of Nexodus right now? How many? Uh, six as of today. As of today. Six. Okay. So, yeah. right. so you got a good uh, half dozen. And did, do you have people who are working with you, but are kind of like on the membership track or not? Yes. Or is that everybody yeah. that works? Okay. And, Every, and, and, everybody. And, everybody who's working with us is on the membership track. Okay. Yeah. So, and then, yeah. And if they're, if they're a certain period of like time of working, we have, mm -hmm. a we have a chance to evaluate their skill set. They have a chance mm -hmm. to evaluate whether or not they want to, you know, be involved with a cooperative or if they just want, you know, just want a job. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, after that introductory period, then there's a, a formal application that they can submit once they've completed that, that process and we'll evaluate and invite them to become members if it, if it makes sense. For yes. both so we, we have like a, a thousand hour threshold that they have to hit mm -hmm. um, before they can apply. And uh, as of right now, the only person to hit that thousand hours has become a member right when he hit it mm -hmm. um and so but we're looking on the cusp of like in the next couple of months here probably adding a couple more people to that because they're about to hit those thresholds you know mm -hmm. and there seems yeah. to be broad interest in general in 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 what we're doing um because it's kind of unheard of and a lot of people you know there there certainly is a word of mouth effect happening and some people we've hired only for contract positions only because it, you know they were certain projects only lasted for a certain period of time um, have expressed interest in, Hey, like, I'd love to work with you guys again. Is there a way I can like try to become a member, you know, in before the thousand hours. So like the interest is there. And now I think mm -hmm. once the, you know, the pandemic starts to subside and some work starts to pick back up, um, you know, a lot of these people that, you know, had on and off jobs during the pandemic, we can start hiring back full time. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. it's a tough time out there for everybody. Yeah. Um, so in terms of you guys being all remote, I saw on the website that you were you know, incorporated in Cincinnati, Ohio. That's your address, I assume, because John's there, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, was, it was kind of it's like, oh, of course, you know, we're all the great uh, Hollywood effects come out of Cincinnati. <laughs> Everybody knows that, right? <laughs> but yeah. uh, so I, Anthony, you're in Kansas, correct? Yep. And John's in uh, Ohio. And then mm -hmm. your other... Uh, members and people working with you are are they scattered all across the country or are they kind of clumped they are. in we, the LA we all area kind of, or Vancouver yeah we all kind of came from I mean we all lived in California I think at one time or another uh, mm -hmm. we all started there and that's pretty much where we all met um, but uh, over time you know we've all scattered so we've got John and I in Ohio and Kansas we've got um, one of our members is in South Carolina one is in um, uh, Oregon and one and one is still in California. Two. So that covers okay. uh, two, okay. two are in California. Yeah. I think there will always be a concentration in California, in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. That's because that's where a lot of the jobs are. But I think, you know, as our company continues to grow and, and this work from home thing, I think I think to a degree we'll always be around. I think that people will start to disperse from California because a lot of people are mm -hmm. only there because this is where the, that's where the industry has historically been. But right. you know, now that there's maybe a window to like leave there and maybe be able to buy a house in an area that's a little bit more affordable or you don't have to commute as far to have an affordable house, I think you'll see a lot more outside of California. Yes. Or at least so, outside of LA. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, personally, I live in uh, rural Western Montana uh, in a town of 500 people. And, you know, I manage a website. Most people in the collective live in DC and New York and uh, but it's, yeah, the, the internet's great for not having to live in big cities if you're not into that or <laughs> being yeah. able to live in the one you want to. Yeah. Um, so I see on your uh, website, besides you guys being this kind of like remote worker co-op, which you've already got like kind of two pretty, um, I don't know to use the buzzword cutting edge or something, you know, you know, two pretty uh, forward looking aspects of your business. Then you've also got, it seems like these kind of cloud services for people who aren't members to just use, right? That you allow people, other people to make use of your uh, VFX tools online um, and charge for that service as well. Could you talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have, uh, we're kind of, we have two things that we're, we're selling currently. One is a traditional visual effects service 
you know, like where, where we act as kind of visual, a visual effects vendor, though that model, even without getting into the intricacies of it, has a, a slightly disruptive pricing model, which, you know, is, is, has so far has gained some acceptance. And I think as more people start to hear about it and understand what we're offering in that way, it, it will probably accelerate. And I think there'll be a lot of interest in it. And, it, and, and that, that pricing structure and that model, which we're pushing certainly is, um, is more, I think, beneficial to artists working than, than maybe the historic, this, this, the traditional model. The other thing that we're offering is the cloud product. So the platform on which we, we work virtually um, and have built over the past couple of years, we're, we're selling and licensing to other, other companies and other individuals uh, to use so that they can also kind of work and collaborate remotely. And anybody that has a need for a really powerful computer, you know, set up, and then also has the need to collaborate with other people on large amounts of data um, could benefit and would benefit from, from our platform. Um, and then, you know, in a third way, anybody that doesn't have the initial capital to maybe start up a business like that in a traditional model, this is also, you know, a, a, a route you can look at, even if you have people working in the same building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and has there been interest in that? It's just like, is that something you kind of, a, a side thing that you're offering to see gauge the interest in, or is that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's still technically in a beta. Uh, okay. There are, there's a lot of interest in it. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, right now it's just about kind of getting out the, the pricing to people so that they, that they, they can understand it. But we certainly have users that are paying, you know, paying customers that are using it. Um, and, and while it's in beta, it's really only in, in beta, not because the product is beta, but because the, the way to sell the product's beta, we're still, you know, trying to figure out the best way to sell mm -hmm. this service uh, to people. Like what's the, the way that makes it the easiest for people to purchase and start using. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we're, what we're exploring in, the, in this kind of beta phase. Cool. That is, yeah, that's, that's super cool. I mean, you guys, uh, I don't, th I mean, you probably are aware of it, but just like as somebody from the outside looking at like, you're doing a number of <laughs> like innovative things kind of all at once. And uh, it's, it's really cool to see. Um, uh, yeah, we, I, we didn't, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it was just, I'm not quite sure how it happened, but it seems like everything we're doing is, is in some way breaking the mold um in not only visual effects but in you know normal capitalist business type things as well so um yeah we're definitely trying to disrupt the industry a little bit and, and in favor of artists because i think the the in, in our industry there's always been this sort of um stigma that you know even when people talk about cg they talk about cgi or that was cgi you know, CG means computer generated. Well, none of this stuff is computer generated. It's all artist generated, you know, like you don't say a painting is paintbrush generated. <laughs> and so there's, 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 all, there's been this stigma behind computer generated imagery and visual effects that in some, some, some way it's the computer doing all the work. And we're trying to sort of refocus everything to, to be, no, you're paying for the talent. And so in, you know, our business model for visual effects is instead of you paying for shots, which is what the normal way of doing things is, is you're gonna pay, you're gonna pay for that talent. And so we're trying to sort of change the business a little bit and focus it more on the artists and the people that are doing the work rather than the, the outcome of the work, so. Right, yeah, so rather than getting a piecework rate, you just kind of have a set, like this is how much we, you have to pay us to do our thing. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're selling the talent. You know, we, we have mm -hmm. really talented, experienced visual effects artists working with us that have been doing this for years and years. Nice. And so we, we are trying to sell them and not the output that they create. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's, uh, there's, there's a couple of, I think the, the main thing that allows us to do that that hasn't, that were the reason it hasn't been done before is what kind of I was getting, alluding to a little bit earlier is um, to, to previously do this, you needed like a big investment in technology, mm -hmm. right? And so these companies that bought this stuff had to then tr try to recoup this, you know, this mm -hmm. investment. Whereas now we can kind of um, 
create little individual like um, teams of people to go work and just build the whole infrastructure quickly, digitally and virtually, you know, for, for, for a specific project. And then when mm -hmm. the project's over, we can kind of close it down. There's no like need to recapture an enormous investment on a specific thing. It's, right. and it's one of the reasons it kind of visual effects developed in the way that it developed, you know, as it is, you know, a lot of other, uh, most other things, film and television shows, like take a television show, for example, they operate, you know, a specific show operates almost as its own individual company, right? And they'll hire a director when they need a director. They'll hire a camera person when they need a camera person. If they need a set dresser, they'll hire a set dresser. And the only reason they haven't hired a visual effects artist previously, you know, to complete the package is because that visual effects artist had to come with a whole mountain of computers to like mm -hmm. do the work. And right, they didn't want to pay for that. <laughs> they didn't want to pay for that. They didn't know how to pay for that. They didn't even know because, you know, it was at one point in the 90s, in the early 2000s, this was like, you know, the computers were not around like the way they are today. And they yeah, were, like your iMac <laughs> couldn't pull off visual effects. Back exactly. Yeah. 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 So, you know, there was a lot more technology that went into doing what we're doing back then in terms of like, you know, uh, proprietary method, methods and technologies, which kind of don't exist anymore. So now you can really create an autonomous little entity of really talented people that, that have access to all these tools on demand and mm -hmm. they can get done the work, you know, for you specifically. So I think it's kind of a couple of things that have led us to this point, which allow this to this business, this business model to exist really right now and not previously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As John said, we're just trying to get them to hire talent as they do for other positions that they have already, you know, they hire editors, mm -hmm. They hire assistant editors, they hire DPs, they hire grips. So, you know, we're just trying to sort of make our model fit that model, you know, which provide, mm -hmm. and provide a way for that to happen. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and in a better way, because I mean, ideally you, you know, get the, that same kind of salary structure, um, but you're working for yourselves, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, in a co-op, which gets to my next kind of uh, question, which is just a little bit about how you guys, uh, you know, do your decision making. How much uh, collective decision making you, you you know you you need to do, or is you know most of the the, the decisions being made in like whoever's working on this particular project and just kind of talk about your management a little bit. One more point to that last thing before I forget yeah. about it that I think is important. Um, you know, also along with this, I think there's the potential to, to really increase the quality of what you're seeing across the board. Not that, I mean, there's a lot of really high end, great looking stuff now out there, but if you look at the current model, it's kind of set up to these companies really realistically from a business standpoint, are trying to deliver the least product and charge the most amount of money, right? Mm -hmm. And this- Good old capitalism. This, yeah, well, I mean, and you know, it, it just is what it is. It's how, that's how they make their money, mm -hmm. right? So, and this model really allows the client that's paying for this to, to choose more directly where they're spending their money so that they can, you know, identify places where the money should be spent and where it doesn't need to be spent. And, and it kind of allows them to make the, those decisions. So I think there's a chance that this business model will also- in the end, lead to higher quality content because mm -hmm. you know you can divert some of that money to specific areas where it's really important important to the storytelling aspect. So, anyway, sorry, we'll we'll yeah, yeah. get on with your your the next point, the decision making <laughs> thing. Anthony, you want you want to take that? <laughs> yeah. So we're you know uh, our bylaws. Uh, we've organized. You know we have a board of directors. Um, Right now, the board is the five founding members. Um, but now that we have our sixth member, uh, we will have an election in uh, June or July. We'll have, a, we'll have our first election in July um, to you know, elect the new board members. Now, there's only six of us, so you know, one person's still going to get left out. But uh, you know, we basically organized in a way where um, you know, the workers will elect the board and the board makes the high level decisions you know the board for instance would hire you know the ceo john mm -hmm. and you know sort of empower him with the uh the ability to make you know decisions for the company so that's really that's our structure um because i think we're we're looking ahead and hoping that we will get larger and so i think we decided that instead of just deciding on everything collectively that would kind of 
muddy the waters a little bit and make mm -hmm. decisions hard to make. And so we, we decided to go for this sort of board structure. And so um, mm -hmm. I think in our bylaws, we have five now. The board can expand itself up to nine members. And I think our plan is really just to expand, you know, to odd numbers only so that there's never a, mm -hmm. you know, a tie in the board or anything like that. And we also mm -hmm. have the ability to bring in outside directors if we, if we feel that that's necessary. Um, you know, and we, and we also have a, um, a structure in our bylaws for, um, for outside investors, kind of like equal exchange. We kind of modeled mm -hmm. our, our bylaws after a lot of what equal exchange, exchange had done. So we have preferred membership um, written into our bylaws so people can invest, you know, without voting, but they can have some capital investment in the business and get dividends based on that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then we, I think we have room on the board for them to have a representative if they want on the board as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I know if I was uh, one of your your six members and the election was coming up, I would be running hard to be the the one guy who doesn't have to show up to board meetings. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. There's no extra pay for board members. So it's yeah. just yeah. you do it because you want to do it as your company. Um, so uh, you guys have been officially in this form of Nexodus now for about nine months. Have you done much work in that period of time yet? Or have you, you getting contracts and doing yeah. jobs and all that? We yeah. did, um, it's online on YouTube and I, we can send you a link to mm -hmm. it so you can see it. But we did... Um, we worked with a, a video game company uh, called Studio Wildcard that developed a, a game uh, called Ark um, that uh, they're developing a sequel for. And we, uh, we helped produce the, the sequel. There's a, like a digital double in that of uh, Vin Diesel. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's like a full, basically four minute short, fully CG film that uh, we can send you the link to, which is kind of the nice. big thing. The big thing that we worked on last year, um, and you know, at one point we had thirty some people working, you know, collaborating on our platform, working on that, um, and that's kind of where a lot of people that you know that are getting close to that six month, a uh, thousand hour thing, are came from from that starting, and then we've been able to you know just continue on. We're also mm -hmm. working on um, some episodics uh, for streaming services out there. So you'll, you know, you'll see our, our, our work on, on an, on a, a television show on one of your streaming services in the near future. <laughs> cool. Yeah. When it comes out, we'll, we'll be able yeah, to we can't, announce can't make, right. the, the yeah. names yet, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, so on your website and it's got the, like worked on the following movies and the big list of all the blockbusters, that's, stuff you've worked on that your people who are working with yeah. you now have worked on previously. Right? Are, okay. That's like a legacy reel. Yeah. Right. So like okay. the people that we've worked, the people that are part of the company now, that's a sample of work that they've done over their right. careers, basically. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, it's my work. It's Frank, who's another member. It's just members. So it's mm -hmm. myself and Frank and Robin and Donald. So we're all artists that have been working in the business a while. So it's a mm -hmm. sort of an amalgamation of our, our past work is what that reel is. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to know if I could, you know, be bragging to people like a worker co-op did that cool Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, no, we didn't actually do um, that. <laughs> I have to wait yeah. a couple of years until I can. Uh, yeah, say that yeah exactly. Well, you can show, you can, or, you, can look, you can have, you can show the arc thing and um, yeah, yeah. in a couple of months, we'll be able to show some work that we did for this television show. And you know, we're, that, that business is kind of just up and up and going now. So I think, you know, there'll be a lot of these shows that come out now every, every year. So cool so i don't know is there anything what did i what should i have asked you about that i didn't ask you about <laughs> what do you think no. um you know we so we decided to kind of take uh you know the seven cooperative principles and we kind of um we kind of made them our own i think we actually have 10 if i remember correctly they're on our website um so that's something that, you know, we kind of added to them and subtracted from mm -hmm. them. You know, one of the things that's in the seven principles, which I'm not, you know, not saying is bad, but it didn't really fit our model was this idea of like local community. Um, mm -hmm. And because we're all remote, it's hard to really, for that to really make sense for our, 
for our mm -hmm. model. Um, you know, we think of our community as like the visual effects artists community. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's our community. Our community's, you know, not all located in one, in one spot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our, our cooperative principles are maybe a little bit different than, you know, just adopting the normal seven that everyone adopts out there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we do try and uh, one of our principles is to, you know, work with other co-ops whenever possible. Um, we, our accountants are a cooperative. Um, key figures out of Austin is who does all our, all our accounting. Mm -hmm. um, so we've tried to, you know, wherever we can, we're going to try and work with other cooperatives. Um, what else? We could give a shout out to Jenny Kassan, who's our lawyer. She's mm -hmm. out of, um, um, is she in Berkeley? She's somewhere Berkeley, over there. In Berkeley, Pacific. yeah. Somewhere. Yeah, somewhere out there. But she's she's been great and she helped us with our bylaws and uh, did, a, did a fantastic job. Um, yeah, I don't know, John, anything else? Um, no, I think, I think in general, a lot of us have kind of the same, the same, you know, motivations. And I think, I think part of moving, moving back, I, you know, I kind of grew up in Cincinnati and, uh, my wife and I live in a small city here, kind of surrounded by the proper, the city proper of Cincinnati, you know, called, called Wyoming, which is a small small community has a very small community feel to it and you know I, I also like work as a firefighter for the city of Cincinnati so these are all like things that I do that I get you know a lot of enjoyment out of and I think kind of taking that to like a, the professional world and working as a community and granted we're not in the same community we don't live in the same place but it certainly is like a, a visual effects you know, community, and we we all came and know kind of the same world. And I think this is just a way for us to work together for for the benefit of all of us. You know, and um, I think that's that's kind of important. And I think you know, outside the drive for just sheer profit, there's other things that are important in the world. And I think that a lot of the traditional business structures don't really allow for having that as a level of importance. You know, I think. The cooperative structure allows us to identify what's important to us and, and make sure that we focus on uh, accomplishing or abiding by or, or doing whatever to, to, to make sure that those things that are important stay important. And we're not just out there to, to make money and, and, and walk away, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our mission statement, you know, is really, um, is really, focused on the workers and sustainability. That's really kind of our thing. Cause I felt like for a long time in visual effects for, for a lot of people, it hasn't been a sustainable industry. You know, you, you go from project to project. Um, sometimes you'll get offered health insurance. Most times you won't, um, you know, if you're in the U S so, you know, you have to, you know, either figure out your own health insurance thing or start and stop and, so what we're trying to do too, one of the big things is as soon as we were able to, which was like literally in our first year, we, we offer health insurance uh, and benefits to our, our members. So as soon as you become a member, you have access to um, all of our benefits. So that was something that was really important to us and that we, you know, without delay, we did as soon as we could. And we're just going to continue to offer, I think, more benefits as the workers want them, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Did you want to mention Canada at all, John? Yeah, so that was the other thing. You know, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, a lot of this business did expand to in Canada to, to Canada because of certain incentives there. Now, you know, some of that, a lot of that population is is kind of imported um, to a degree from kind of all over the world. And, you know, some of it, obviously, you know, and a lot of it has now been developed kind of locally. You know, I think since the early 2000, mid 2000s, um, you know, a lot of these little schools have popped up to teach kind of what it is we do. And then a lot of people came into, came to there, you know, at one point it was certainly like a lot of the technical stuff was figured out in Los Angeles or in the U S and then like the, the nitty gritty, like get it, get in, into the weeds, doing the actual work. Some of it that that's the work that was initially shipped to Canada. Mm -hmm. And now over the past, you know, 10, 10 years, basically 10, 20, 10, 20 years now, almost Canada has a lot of that just natural talent that 
came out of Canada and has learned and continued to develop. And they're like, you know, equally, equally as capable of doing high-end visual effects work that anybody in Los Angeles is certainly. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think we've structured our bylaws to allow for membership anywhere basically on the planet. The most natural extension next for us will be Canada. And we've kind of already explored some of that, um, some of those kind of possibilities working with people that I had worked with in Vancouver uh, before to, to see one kind of what the interest level there is among individuals and talent, you know, or would somebody be interested in joining a cooperative? And then two, um, how do you logistically do that from a, a business and a financial standpoint with the international border? And I think anything that we can do to make the international border and the currency different as, in, as invisible as possible to the artists and allow for a really mm -hmm. truly collaborative kind of experience of people from all over the world, um, you know, while still being able to take advantage of all those business uh, advantages there are maybe, um, but you know, maybe for the benefit of this group, whether they right. be U.S. citizens or citizens of the world, you know, it's part of the, mm -hmm. the visual effects community. And I think that also will maybe allow us to be a, have a little bit of an edge on some other people that we're able to hire this person from you know whatever Eastern Europe to do this thing that this guy that you know he's really good at this thing or you know this woman from Taiwan is really good at something specific. So how do you? invite her to work alongside you like you can do it virtually with our platform if i want her to start working tomorrow i can mm -hmm. give her credentials and she can log in and start working collaboratively on our stuff right away i don't have to worry about shipping a computer to her house or data back and forth like none of that none of there's no limitations there the only limitations really are figuring out the legalities of how it how to make it how to make it work and that's kind of mm -hmm. what we're, we're doing now with some of these people in canada that i've worked with before we were, I can't remember the name of their. I think it's a Federation of Canadian. Yeah, it's, or it's basically like, like the Canadian version of the U.S. Federation of Co-ops. It's like yeah. their sister entity or whatever. We reached out to them um, because we were looking for advice on like, if we, how are we, you know, if we were to structure this, how would it work? You know, we really, uh, and we're still working on it. This is not anything that's mm -hmm. in progress, but you know, we were trying to figure out like, how would we make it so that we could still have one governance structure um in place but you know be able to hire canadians uh mm -hmm. and pay them as if they were working for a company in canada so mm -hmm. um it's it's looking like we might be able to start up like a a subsidiary in canada that would be sort of a pass-through entity for us mm -hmm. so that they would still be members of our u.s co-op even though they live in canada and then they would just get paid through this subsidiary of, of, of us mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, something like that that's kind of what we're looking at right now so. right yeah just it's always a matter of trying to figure out how you can do the thing you want to do <laughs> while jumping through all the hoops yeah i mean right definitions and end of the day we want to support those people that we've worked with and that are super talented and you know we've already got one of them working for us now um but just as a contractor because there's no really uh Excellent. legal yeah. way for us to pay him as like a What's the what's the Canadian W two equivalent? It's like a T four T four. There's no there's no way for us to pay him as a T four employee mm -hmm. at the moment. I think, and there there's a there's a lot of I think in general it seems like the just theoretically there's a lot of support for what we're doing. You know, a lot of the mm -hmm. labor laws that exist in these places exist to protect workers, and I think we would certainly meet the minimum qualifications. Or probably trying to offer more. So it's just a matter of like trying to figure out the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah which is going to be complicated, but you know, we're yeah, gonna, we're going to do it. <laughs> we're going to do it. We're going to do it. <laughs>